من سخنان بعدی رو معرفی میکنم خدمت ناشت کنم پروفسور رابرت ریچارد استاد برجسته تاریخ و فلسفه زیستشناسی در دانشگاه شیکاگو معلف چندین کتاب که بسیار با بزرگواری و فروتنی دعوت ما رو پذیرفتن و الان هم ساعت هشت و ده دقیقه صبح هست در شیکاگو محبت کردن بلند شدن و آماده هستن برای ارائهشون فایلشون رو هم الان ما فعال میکنیم Hello, Bob. Good morning. Hi, Reza. How are you? I'm very well. Okay, so are you ready for your presentation? I am. Okay, so take ownership and go ahead. So I want to thank uh, you and your colleagues for this splendid invitation. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Let me see if I can take... Ownership, yeah. I'm going to offer you a rather unorthodox view of Darwin's accomplishment. In his play, Back to Methuselah, the great British playwright, George Bernard Shaw, said in the preface to that play, uh, you cannot understand Moses without imagination, nor Spurgeon, who was a famous preacher of the day, Without, a me without metaphysics, but you could be a thoroughgoing neo-Darwinian without imagination, metaphysics, poetry, conscience, or decency, for natural selection has no moral significance. It deals with that part of evolution which has no purpose, no intelligence, and might more appropriately be called accidental selection, or better still, unnatural selection, so no since nothing is more unnatural than an accident. If it could be proved that the whole universe had been produced by such selection, only fools and rascals could bear to live. One of those rascals is, that's George Bernard Shaw, Michael Roos. He seems to be standing up just fine. In a book that we've co-authored called Debating Darwin, Roos supplies the orthodox assessment of Darwin's accomplishment. Darwin banished notions of purpose and teleology from the scientific understanding of nature. He introduced blind mechanical processes to explain the descent of species. In his world, human beings have no special place. Indeed, our evolution is assumed to be highly contingent. It could well have been that currently only cockroaches would be inhabiting our world. It's merely accidental that we human beings are here today. Now, I don't think George Bernard Shaw or Michael Roos are correct. I propose to show that Darwinian nature, at least as originally conceived by its author, was not bereft of meaning or moral values, as is usually presumed. Indeed, this is the common presumption of both opponents and supporters of Darwinian evolution. I rather believe that Darwin demonstrated the power of mind in nature and he had, and that nature had us in view. The construction of Darwin's theory. Darwin was indeed an individual who ushered in the modern world. But this needs to be expressed in a particular kind of way. He was one whose values, assumptions, and science were formed in the pre-modern world of the early 19th century. Let me attempt to briefly show you that Darwin constructed his theory using conceptions of a rather traditional sort. When one comes to understand exactly what the instruments of his construction were, the whole Bauplan appears, I believe, in a rather different light, not quite so harsh or impervious to human aspirations, not quite so meaningless as Shaw and Roos affirm. Now, what were those instruments? Well, there was teleological causality a presumption of moral embeddedness, a conception of mind at work in the world. The result was a universe with a distinctive developmental trajectory, namely human beings as authentically moral creatures. Let me uh, indicate this. By looking at the very last part of the origin of species, 
This is the last paragraph of the origin. Thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we're capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals directly follows. There's grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed laws of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Now, the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving, namely the highest animal, of course, is man, human beings. Darwin had recognized from a very early period that what seemed distinctive about human beings was not their reasoning ability. Animals quite often displayed the rudiments of reason. Human beings were moral creatures, and no animal was a moral creature except human beings. So the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving is a human being with his moral sentiments. That is to say, man as a moral animal is the teleological goal of nature, according to Darwin's theory. Now, needless to say, this is not the usual picture of Darwin's accomplishment. He's most often represented by the likes of Stephen Jay Gould, Richard Lewinton, Richard Dawkins, Dan Dennett, Michael Roos, and a host of others as having banished teleology from nature, as having constructed natural selection as a blind mechanical process that has eradica eradicated the least tincture of non-selfish behavior from human beings. As I mentioned, I believe Darwin in fact constructed nature as having a goal, an end, human beings as moral creatures. Moreover, he advanced a view of human nature that made human beings authentically moral creatures as authentic altruists. Before dealing with the arguments for these conclusions, a few words about Darwin's early life are in order. During his final year at Cambridge University, Darwin picked up a copy of Alexander von Humboldt's multi-volume depiction of his journey to South and Central America in 1799. It was a trip that lasted five years, and it was a journey filled with adventure. Darwin was enthralled by Humboldt's descriptions, and as if his wish were a command, he got the opportunity to sail away from England on a surveying ship, HMS Beagle. His travels like Humboldt lasted almost five years, setting sail in December, 1831, and returning in Oct October 1836. While excavating in the areas where the beagle came to port, Darwin uncovered the kinds of fossil bones like those of the Toxodont. In retrospect, the most famous place that Darwin visited on the voyage was 600, was 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador, the Galapagos Islands. During his time on the Beagle, Darwin seemed to have remained perfectly orthodox in his biology. He held to the conviction that species remain stable over time. There's really no indication uh, while he was on the trip that he had changed his mind about the stability of species. After he returned to England in October of 1836 and began sorting the specimens he brought back, it was only then that Darwin began seriously to consider that species might change. Primed with knowledge of his grandfather and uh, uh, Jean Baptiste de Lamarck, their transmutational views, he began to speculate on the alteration of species over time. This occurred in March of 1837, and from March of 1837 to the publication of The Descent of Man in 1871, some 34 years, Darwin con continued to develop his theory. Here's the trajectory of his writings. So in 1837 to 1842, he keeps a series of notebooks, the so-called transmutation notebooks, in which he's speculating about species change and what might explain species change. In 1842, uh, he writes a small pencil sketch of his ideas essentially the, the kernel of the origin of species. And he puts that away, and in two years later, he writes another essay based on the first, which is much longer, and he has a good copy made, uh, the kind of copy that a printer could use for publication. 
and he leaves 400 pounds in his will should he die before his great ideas saw the light of day. Uh, and that, that sketch is about 235 pages. In 1848 to 1854, he sets aside his work on species change and constructs four volumes on the morphology of barnacles. And in 1856 to 57, he begins writing a long manuscript that was going to be called Natural Selection. This was his theory of the evolution of and transmutation of species under natural selection. And in 1858, he gets a letter from Alfred Russell Wallace saying that he has a theory of species change and Darwin is chagrined. Darwin is nonplussed because it's as if Wallace had been reading over his shoulder out of his own notebooks because Wallace's views were so similar to those of Darwin. So he puts away the big manuscript. He uh, summarizes the first part and adds those chapters that would needed to be done. And in 1859, he publishes The Origin of Species. In 1868, uh, he works on a book called The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication. And in 1871, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. So that's the trajectory of his writing. He first explored what we would think of as Lamarckian devices to explain species change. But in September of 1838, he read for amusement, as he put it in his autobiography, Thomas Malthus's essay on the principle of population. Malthus has planted the seed of what would become Darwin's device of natural selection. This new causal principle would push into the background his other Lamarckian principles, though without eliminating them from his repertoire. Darwin remained convinced of the inheritance of acquired characteristics throughout his life. What Malthus did was provide the key notion of population pressure, more offspring of organisms, whether they be tiger or tiger lilies, uh, would be produced than the environment could sustain. Hence, if among individuals so produced, any had any trait that gave them a slight advantage, they would have a better chance of reaching reproductive age and passing on those traits. Gradually then, members of a species would change throughout, through slow accommodation of adaptive advantages. Now, a crucial problem that Darwin hit concerning his developmental principle of natural selection was this. How could the very refined adaptations that nature exhibited be produced by selection, especially if natural selection operated like a mechanical contrivance, as Michael Roos and others presume? Darwin's partly solved this problem by the model he chose to represent natural selection. The model for natural selection that Darwin chose is not some Manchester mechanical loom or a steam-driven industrial machine. Rather, the model Jar Darwin chose was that of a supremely intelligent being. He describes this model in his essays of 1842 and 1844. In the essay of 1844, that model is expressed this way. He says, let us now suppose, now this is going to be the model for natural selection. Let us now suppose a being with penetration sufficient to perceive differences in the outer and innermost organization, quite imperceptible to man, and without and with forethought extending over future centuries, to watch with unerring care and select for any object the offspring of an organism produced under the foregoing circumstances. I can see no conceivable reason why he could not form a new race or several were he to separate the stock of the original organisms and work on several islands adapted to new ends. As we assume his discrimination and his forethought and his steadiness of object to be incomparably greater than those qualities in man, so we may suppose the beauty and complications of the adaptations of the new races and their differences from the original stock to be greater than in the domestic races produced by man's agency. Moreover, such a being could have purposes, that is forethought, and aim for certain goals. The assumption that nature acting as a selector could solve another problem for Darwin, one left over from his grandfather. Uh, the problem was this, there are two distinct modes of generation of animal 
reproduction. One, asexual modes engaged in by sponges and other uh, zoophytes, and sexual reproduction. Now, the question for Darwin was how to explain sexual reproduction. In his transmutation notebooks, uh, Darwin gives a teleological explanation of how sexual reproduction occurred. He says, my theory gives great final cause of sexes, for otherwise there would be as many species as individuals. He seems to have thought that if asexual reproduction were the mode, each individual would be, as it were, an independent species. If all individuals were species, there would not be social animals, which as I hope to show is the foundation of all that is most beautiful in the moral sentiments of the animated beings. If man is one great object, that is one great purpose, for which the world was brought into present state, and if my theory be true, then the formation of sex is rigidly necessary. Now, this is not the kind of language you would expect from a mechanist. That intelligent being was not a passing conception conf uh, confined to the immature Darwin. That being reappears in the origin of species in his portrayal of natural selection. This is Darwin's description of natural selection in the origin of species. And you can see it's based on the notion of an intelligent natural selection as an intelligent being. Man can act only on external and visible characters. Nature cares nothing for appearances except insofar as they may be useful to any being. Man selects only for his own good. Nature only for that of the being which she tends. Can we wonder then that nature's productions should be far truer in character than man's productions, that they should be infinitely better adapted to the most complex conditions of life and should plainly bear the stamp of a, high, of a far higher workmanship? And he continues, it may be said that natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world, every variation, even the slightest, rejecting that which is bad, preserving and adding up all that is good swiftly and insensibly working whenever and wherever opportunity offers at the improvement of each organic being. Notice that natural selection works to improve each organic being. That's quite different than our usual conception of natural selection, which doesn't improve most organic beings, it destroys most organic beings. The assertion that natural selection works for the good of each organic being appears at least six times in the origin of species. For example, in the penultimate uh, paragraph of the book, and as natural selection works solely by and for the good of each being, all corporeal and mental endowments will tend to progress towards perfection. That's a view of the operations of natural selection that is not common for contemporary neo-Darwinians. Again, it's the notion that natural selection works by and for the good of each being. That's a moral perception of the actions of natural selection. Now, let me look back at that first, uh, last paragraph in The Origin of Species. Thus, from the war of nature, from, fam from famine and death, the most exalted object, the most exalted purpose, which we're capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, directly follows, and so on. Now, consider the archaeology of that passage. Oops. Here is the crucial passage in the origin of species. The most exalted object which we're capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows, which seems to be based on that passage in the 1844 essay. The most exalted end which we're capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, has directly proceeded, which is based on the 1842 essay, the highest good which we can conceive, the creation of the higher animals, has directly come, which is based on that notebook passage, man is the one great object, that is the one great purpose, for which the world was brought into its present state. Now, let me summarize what I take to be the usually neglected features of Darwin's theory that cast it in a quite different light, a light which illuminates the differences between his theory and our neo-Darwinian conceptions. 
Darwin's natural selection operates as an agent having intentional power. The causal action of selection had those features that allowed the discernment of traits with a refinement that simply could not be equaled by any 19th century machine. Second, natural selection had a kind of moral solicitude. It acted for the benefit, it acted for the benefit of each creature. Now, we of course today deny natural selection operates for the benefit of individuals. Third, natural selection acts with purpose and produces a general pro progress in evolutionary development. As Darwin put it in the penultimate paragraph of the Origin of Species, as natural selection works by and for the good of each being, all corporeal and mental endowments will tend to progress towards perfection. Now, again, most biologists today tend to deny that natural selection produces general progress. Finally, the progress produced by natural selection has as its goal the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals. That is, human beings with their moral sentiments. This kind of global teleology is rejected utterly by virtually every evolutionary biologist writing today. Darwin ushered in the modern world, there is no doubt. Like Moses, he heralded the promised land, but he remained behind, in Darwin's case, a 19th century thinker. Darwin, it's often worthwhile to emphasize, was not a neo-Darwinian. Thank you very much.